Welcome to the Jewish Arts and Open Studios online programs. We will be presenting one hour programs with two to four artists once or twice a month into spring 2021. The featured artists coming in programs are members of the Jewish Arts Salon who responded to a call or were invited. The next December 15th uh, Eastern Time, uh, we will announce the artist presenters. So far, we have uh, Ashley Scott uh, Fitzgerald and a uh, Sheriff Cinnamon. Uh, today, we will present two artists, Siona Benjamin and Julian Voloch. Siona Benjamin is a painter from Mumbai, India, now living in the US. Her work reflects her background of being brought up Jewish in a mostly Hindu and Muslim culture. Siona earned a Master in Fine Arts in Paintings and a second MFA in Theater Set Design. She has exhibited her work in the US, Europe, and Asia. Siona does private and public art commissions while also selling and exhibiting in galleries and museums. She was awarded a Fulbright Fellowship in 2011 to India and a second Fulbright in 2017 to Israel. Siona's work has been featured in the New York Times, the Chicago Tribune, the Philadelphia Inquirer, the Financial Times, the Jewish Week, the Boston Globe, Art New England, Art and Antiques, Art News, the Times of India, the Jerusalem Post, the Times of Israel, and several other publications. A documentary on her work entitled Blue Like Me, The Art of Siona Benjamin, is now available on Amazon.com. I invite Siona to present her work. And Siona, before you uh, begin to introduce your short film, I would just like to jump in and invite everyone to put questions for Siona in the chat. And then when we um, continue with Julian, I also will ask you to continue with your questions and I will moderate a discussion. After Julian's presentation, we will hopefully have time for uh, follow-up questions, not only for him, but also for both the artists. So um, I'm going to queue up your film, Siona, and would you please introduce it? Sure. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Jewish Art Salon. My Jewish Art Salon is like a family to me now. Thank you, Judith and Dorit, and of course, Yona and Cheslin and Kana and everybody. Um, thank you for inviting me. It's been a wonderful journey with the Jewish Art Salon. And what I thought I would do today is something different, something different because I normally do the full PowerPoint presentation. The Monkai Art Museum earlier this summer did a 12 minute film and the 12 minute film was very well edited. So I thought I would show that film because it's uh, you know something unique and different talking about what I'm doing right now in the pandemic. Uh, time. And after that, I'll do six minutes of just a short PowerPoint showing you the results of what was done, you know, what was happening uh, in the summer. So you can see some of the results of the projects that I've been doing. Uh, so roll it, Judith. Thank you. My name is Siona Benjamin, and I am an artist living and working in Montclair, New Jersey. I am invited to uh, share my studio and my art with you today and I'd like to start by telling you a little bit about my work. I am uh, a transcultural artist. I have lived in Montclair since 2002 and I've lived in the United I'm States. Sorry, it's not thinking correctly. Years. I came here for graduate studies and I stayed since. Um, I have been I have been brought up in India in a predominantly Hindu Muslim society. I have been educated in Catholic and Zoroastrian schools and I was raised Jewish in India and now living in America. And I have always had to reflect upon these cultural boundary zones in which I have lived. Thus in my paintings, I combine the imagery of my past with the role I play in America today making a mosaic inspired mostly by illuminated manuscripts and multicultural mythology. So you'll see many blue skinned characters populate in my paintings. This self portrait of sorts takes on many roles and forms 
through which I can theatrically explore ancient and contemporary dilemmas. These characters enact their stories, often myths from various cultures and religions, becoming symbols of a timeless global identity, free of prejudices and boundaries. Making my characters, you know, they come alive and enacting their stories as they reach out from their mythological past. Besides Jewish myth, I'm also inspired by Hindu, Buddhist mythology, Christian and Islamic illuminated manuscripts. Therefore, in my work, um, I show how my characters in my paintings use their blue skin to mostly tell or retell stories. And in this process of recycling and rejuvenating, they merely remind me in making the work and hopefully my audience in viewing the work that myth making is cyclical and timeless. Thus the blue skin for me has become a symbol of being a Jewish woman of color. So I'd like to take you around my studio today. I'd like to show you my current projects, a few of them, and I would also like to share with you uh, some of the projects that I'm working on. So how does an artist, a freelance artist, make one's living? Um, do many commissions. Um, I exhibit quite a lot. I do lectures and presentations and I get paid for that. I do workshops. Uh, teaching different techniques or talking about uh, different subjects. Um, I also sometimes, uh, you know, do private public commissions. And for example, I just finished a commission for the uh, new hotel in Montclair, the MC Hotel, where I did seven uh, six foot paintings for them on the seven floors of their hotel. Um, I also, there's a example behind me where I've done a f entire floor for a synagogue where I designed the, uh, the floor and then it was executed in ceramic tiles. Uh, I'm also doing some other projects which I can uh, take you through. For example, I'm working with uh, my private art dealer in Mount Montclair, Heather Carter, and we are starting a project called Cause for Comfort where uh, some of my new paintings, which I will be showing you, they're really small paintings. And uh, we're going to, uh, you know, make pillowcases and uh, throw blankets. Uh, it's going to be made in India by my shawl manufacturer there, because I also have a business in silk shawls and yoga mats. Also, we'll be giving a part of the proceeds to a pandemic cause. So um, besides this, um, I also will share with you uh, I'm currently doing a book with a professor at Georgetown University, Professor Ori Soltis, and it's called Growing Up Jewish in India, From the Bene Israel to the Art of Siona Benjamin. I've been working on a series titled Exodus, I See Myself in You, based on the inspiration and concepts of exploring paradise or pardes in Hebrew and Jannat in Urdu Arabic. I have created a series of works which discusses and questions, what is the quest for paradise? Recent history and news has made me question why we all as human beings seek and strive for perfection in paradise. At what cost do we want to attain it? And why do we seek that ultimate perfect home? Looking at the thousands of images that flood the news today of people who are displaced from their homes, these refugees roaming the world are in their constant search for their lost paradise and their quest for a new one. Finding home number 56, Zakham, is inspired from a page in the Quran, but also from Jewish eliminated manuscripts. Are the swords a weapon that will descend on her, or are they a protection against unforeseen dangers? What seems like Urdu or Arabic writing above actually spells out, it's unfortunate in English. Finding home number 89, Farishte Vashti. Vashti was cast out. Now she looks in. A black and white setting from yesteryear. Postcards from another target. A chessboard of genocide. The near tamid of a lost synagogue. A palace of another dictator. Smokestacks from your ancestors' crematorium. I search during my journey but cannot find how can they erase without a trace, I wonder. Now more than necessary, along with her dignity, will she restore yours? 
Amistad is the title of this new piece that I'm working on. It's called Amistad because it is inspired by the slave ship of bringing slaves to this country. Based on the research that I made on the concept of eugenics, I was inspired to make a boat like triptych, inspired by the medieval Renaissance European retabla like structures found in many churches which open up to display beautiful Judeo-Christian themes. I combined that shape with the idea of a boat, a slave ship, and the boats carrying numerous refugees, hopefully onto safety and asylum from their countries and dictators of persecution. Many blue seed seated men sit packed in the golden boat, huddled, motionless, scared, yet hopeful. Hopeful, but for what? Hopeful not to be thrown back into the ocean. Hopeful not to be sent back to their destruction and dissolution. Lilith, who is the central figure in this painting, who's also Kali, who's also Medusa, always blamed for her cries of mercy and justice, she surfaces again and yet again, glassy eyed and golden mouth, hand cutting the cord and the balancing justice at the same time. This is a painting I have made for a commission for a synagogue. Um, I will be doing the design for the Torah Ark curtain and the table cover in front of the Torah Ark. These are all the sketches that I did initially and um, some of these sketches have been translated into the final paintings. These paintings are scanned and then sent to the fabric manufacturer which will be made into a curtain material and sewn for the Torah Ark curtain which is called a parochette for a synagogue. So anyway, um, my book uh, is coming out soon and it is um, going to be published and released sometime soon and here is a uh, a paragraph from it, a short paragraph, which will give you uh, a little idea about what the book is about. It's about uh, growing up Jewish in India, but it's also about the different communities. And it's about uh, my two Fulbright projects, which is about the Indian Jews in India and in Israel. So this di diasporic distance in my life seemed to widen as the years went on. My parents in India most of my family in Israel, a few relatives in the US and Canada, and even an aunt in Africa. My parents visited me very often when I came to study and later on when I decided to live in the US. I did not exactly plan to live here, but I feel that my lack of being grounded and rootlessness in so many ways gave me license to live here and anywhere for that matter. Pitching my tent first and wondering later how I got there and why I stayed. I grew so used to being rootless that it seemed it was only it was the only way to be. I did not like it and I often be, often secretly envied people who had hordes of family around them and were grounded in one solid place. I had not experienced this, making me long for a permanent home, one where I could stay and have lived my whole, whole life in. Later in my life, I did learn the true meaning of making all, the, all these transcultural friends who became my family in so many ways. This rootlessness taught me to absorb and search for diversity and uniqueness. And I realized that I often felt bored when put in a homogeneous situations. This diasporic, almost schizophrenic life became gradually alluring and inviting and I grew to like it, to love it actually. That's always seeking something different from what or where I was. Now I realized that seeking something different was seated in me from the very beginning. That diversity was already in my childhood home. I have known no other way and I have known no other kind of life. I'd like to conclude by saying that um, in this time of uncertainty, one does not really know the answers, but magically when I paint, all my worries seem to melt away and the flow of creativity takes over. It's this creativity that saves us artists, I believe, every single time. 
I'm trying my best to learn new ways to overcome old ways and old methods of doing things as change is inevitable and we are all in flux. But I do believe in the power of art to be able to make change in this world possible. I believe the power of art will sustain and will remain as it always has. I'd like to thank the Monker Art Museum for inviting me to do this video and to share my art. I am really thankful to be in this beautiful, thriving community of Montclair. Okay, thank you, Siona. You, you can please share the link for the book. Uh, somebody asked for it on the chat. Yes, I, I will definitely do that. Um, it's not out yet. The, the book is going to be out by the, by the beginning of next year, but I'll talk a little bit about it. So I have six minutes. I'm going to set a timer <laughs> so I don't go over six minutes because I want to be conscious of the time to give Julian enough time. So um, I'm going to uh, share my screen now and show you some results of what it was shown in the videos and what some of the projects that have come into fruition. Okay, can everybody see? Yes, it looks great. Okay, great, great. So I'm gonna start six minutes. Okay, um, so to tell you uh, really quickly, uh, some of the results of some of the commissions and work that I've been doing. And the reason why I chose to talk about this is because I think the pandemic made us all very scared. It made me very scared about thinking, oh my God, you know, since I'm a freelance artist like Judith and all of us, you know, it's just scary to see what, you know, Art is the least priority for people in, you know, in, in cases of pandemics, you know, so, but um, I had some lined up and it's, I think it's a lot about reaching out to people and I found out that art is still important to people, no matter whatever tragedies we go to, it's still a, like a kind of a refuge or, so um, this is one of the commissions that I did for the Montclair Hotel. It said it's seven, six foot artworks for every floor. And this is uh, one of the pieces installed in the lobby uh, that you, I think, saw a little bit in the video. But I wanted to show this again because um, I did a part two of this. Um, oh, wait, actually, I'll show you the, I'm going to show that later. This is the, the other commission that I talked about also in the, in the video for the synagogue. So uh, this is the final painting that I did. And the process is what I wanted to share. So the painting is uh, done on a wooden board and then it is scanned. And uh, once it is scanned, then it is sent off to my printers, either in India, or in this case, I did it with a printer in San Francisco. Um, and they printed um, the, the painting onto wonderful fabric, and it was sewn with velvet backing, and it became the parochet or the Torah art curtain and the amud or the table cover for the synagogue. And um, uh, the synagogue, you know, loves it, and they are thinking of doing a second project, which I hope to involve uh, Judith with. So this is what the synagogue looks like. Um, the parochet looks like from this. It's added a blast of color, and uh, the parochet was actually about the story of Joseph. So they had murals on either side about the twelve tribes, but they didn't have anything about the about Joseph. So they decided to do the curtain about Joseph. And all we, you know, the rabbi and me, we did a little midrash study and we came up with all the symbols about Joseph and uh, that's what comprises this curtain. The second, uh, another project was uh, for a hotel. Um, these are two murals. Uh, one was 22 feet by six feet and the other one was 18 feet diameter. Um, the 22 feet mural was uh, one of my paintings which was converted into dye bond, which is a material used for road signs. And also the 18 foot mural was done in dye bond. Uh, the 18 foot mural was done in collaboration with Yona, Yona Verver. I invited, uh, we invited her to, uh, so the center part, the sky is done by Yona and the border around it is done by me. So it was, uh, so this is what the mural looks like installed on the side of the hotel. This is one of the murals. Um, again, it is waterproof and rainproof, and it um, and it's uh, not ceramics, but it is a 
like a material called Daibon. And here's the mural done with Yona and the center rotunda of the hotel. It was very fun to work with her and uh, as always, and um, we had a blast. So it was, this was one other project. Um, this is the Amistad project. I, in between my commissions, I want to do my work, my own work. So like I'm doing a uh, illustration for a children's book right now. So whenever there's downtime, I tend to do some of my own work so I can continue my own work. This is the Amistad project that I talked about. And it's about the slave ship. Um, and uh, this, these are the, I had got, I had uh, done 3D printing of these, uh, these uh, seated men to show them packed in a boat. And um, uh, that's what it kind of looks like now. I still haven't finished it. I still have to work on several parts of it, but it's getting closer and closer. Uh, I also have to paint the outside of the triptych because this, uh, this 3D triptych closes like a, like a retabla. Um, so that's one project which I'm doing right now of my own. This is not a commission, but I hope it sells. <laughs> Uh, this is another project that I did, which is called Circle of Introspection series. Um, these are positive mandalas done in response to the negative circular COVID virus. So I thought the circular COVID virus was this menacing kind of awful looking kind of creature. And so I looked into the Islamic mandalas that I had studied. And um, I did, I've done a series of four so far. They were very meditative and calming to work on during this sort of trying time and in between my commissions. So I've done so four so far and um, uh, it's called the Circle of Introspection series. And um, they have, I've incorporated my blue character in there also. Um, and uh, they, like I said, they were really, really fun to do. So here's something that I, one of my own projects. And uh, Right now I'm doing a children's book illustration commission where is actually it's a Jewish children's book. It is about the story of Hava and Aguila. And they have, pers they have made Hava into a character and uh, it's going to be the publisher is in Seattle, the designer is in Spain, the author is in Canada and I'm in New Jersey. So we have interesting Zoom sessions where uh, we all have to find the right time for all of these countries to meet together. <laughs> Uh, but it's been really fun so far and um, a lot of work. Okay, my timer is off, so I better go quickly. This is the book, the cover of the book that's coming up, which you saw in the video. It should be out by early next year, latest by February, March. Uh, this is another book that just is coming out. The CRC Floor that I talked about in the video has published a book called The Zodiac Floor, and that should be available on their website sometime soon for purchase. This is another book that just came out by the same publishers. And this is interesting because it is a creative inspiration book for young adults. So they interviewed several artists, filmmakers, chefs of the, you know, in the Jewish background. And we talk about how to inspire young children or young adults to find their voice in how to find a career in, in the arts. So it's a very unique and different book that I got included in. I do uh, collaborations with dancers. Uh, this is at the, at the hotel. They invited me to do bring four of my dancers for the opening of the hotel. Again, they're personalized from the blue characters in my work and they are theatrical and they act dance out parts of my paintings. Um, this is another thing which I wanted to include is that how do you make art accessible to people who are not wealthy? So those who cannot buy expensive paintings, they can buy a $65 shawl or a $100 yoga mat. And I think that is really important that where an artist can make a living, but also you can make it accessible to a lot more people and a lot of different stratas. Um, these are my yoga mats with my, um, you know, my daughter modeling for free <laughs> for me. Um, so these are my yoga mats. I have them, I have a separate website called uh, Blue Like Me. This is the cause for comfort. This is another project which I did with my um, uh, with my art dealer. It's very wonderful because we've included the Moncler Art Museum, Repair the World, which is an organization in New York City, and um, Ekal, which is an organization in India. And we give percentages of the sales of these products to these, to these, uh, to these uh, corporations, to these uh, venues. So this way it's a win-win for all, and they publicize it and 
the artist and the agent earns the living, but also uh, the venue gets something in return. And last of all, here's my two websites and the Blue Like Me documentary, like Dory said, is available on Amazon. So I hope you will check it out at some other time. Thank you so much. I really appreciate this invitation and I'm going to not shop, stop sharing. Thank you so much. Thank you, Siona. And we do have time for a couple of questions. Um, first of all, I just want to comment that your work is just beautiful and inspiring and it's, it's exciting to see you working across so many media. Thank so um, Beth Adler had a question. Go ahead, Beth, unmute yourself, please, and ask your question. I'm sorry. Um, yeah, the work is just gorgeous. I'm um, in awe. I was wondering if the paintings in the hotels were done, were originals and done at that size, or did you do them smaller and have them enlarged like some of the other projects you discussed? Yes. Okay, that's a very good question. And it's, you're an artist, so it's a good process question. Um, so when I got the commission, they said, um, we have, um, I'll tell you, it's, it's okay for artists to know, uh, $25,000. And I said, I'm not gonna make seven six foot paintings for that money, that's like too little. So, but I didn't wanna give up the project too because it was still good money. So uh, I came up with an idea and the interior designer who's this am amazing interior designer said, that's a great idea, like how you, how you made it work. So I did the one painting, the, the main painting in the lobby is original, done on a six foot canvas. Then I had my student assistants, I mean, I had it scanned professionally. Then the scan came back to me and my assistant. And then we sat and we uh, broke apart each one of those pieces which are from the scan. And then we did six more versions on the computer. So summer, winter, monsoon, uh, pink night, blue night, you know, like we did six more versions of it on the computer, but it was like, painting but on the computer but it was not like actual painting so I still got the project and I still did it and then I sent it back to my amazing printer in Pennsylvania he's just like he can make the you know print look better than the painting it's just amazing mm -hmm. and then he printed it on six foot canvases and then those were framed so um, so the one is original and the six are painted on computer so they're sections, they're taken from sections of the yes. painting. Yeah, so we had to break yeah. apart all the parts. Yes, that's a we great took idea. the deer out, we took the bird out, like the deer became gray, then the deer became darker brown, then the, the trees became, you know, a different color. And then we kind of put it back together and mixed and matched and thought, okay, what's the season we can create? Oh. Interesting. So this Thank way, I mean, it was a good size project. Why give it up, right? Like it paid my bills for several months, but you know, I could have said no and just walked away and said, but you have to, as an artist, you have to learn to kind of work with things. And I've learned that, you know, try to make it work somehow. Mm -hmm. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you, Beth. Um, we have one more question for, from Tina Marcus and we've just got about a minute. So Tina, go ahead and ask your question. Unmute yourself, please. So Sonia, oh, your work is just fascinating. The colors are like eye candy. I can't stop looking, they're just wonderful. Um, so my question is, is that the back of the triptych that you're working on, your own personal um, you know, fun, how do you envision that? Because I, I understand it will close, but I was just wondering what you're envisioning right now as to be that back part of that, that, that work. Right. Um, so um, it's kind of a process. I'm not so sure right now. I'm still thinking and wondering, like I've gotten some ideas that triptych will be closed all the time because it's like a retabla, right? But when it will be displayed, I'm thinking it'll be open mostly. Unless, of course, the venue provides gloves to the viewer so they can close it and open it. Like they give you, they sometimes keep white gloves over there in a museum and then you can like open it and close it you know, by touching the piece, so to speak, and they secured well to the wall. But um, if they can't, um, I'm thinking that it has to be something reminiscent of what is inside. You know, it has to give a clue to what is inside. So it's like, it can't give it away because it's a box, right? So I'm thinking like maybe a, silhou maybe a silhouette of one of the refugees, the cedared men, you know, could be like outside and could be, he could be like across both the doors 
but I could go leaf him instead of having him blue like he's inside and then do the background blue to kind of reverse the colors and then have it something big and bold. But then inside when you open, I like boxes because they're like surprises. You know, it's like revealing, revealing what's in your heart, you know? So uh, when, um, when it's closed, you know, it's like a mystery. So, but a little clue would be nice. I'm not really sure right now. I'm still working it out. <laughs> no, I look forward to seeing it. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so thank much. Thank you, Tina. And thank you, Siona. And um, please continue to put your questions for Siona in the chat and hopefully we will have time at the end. And now um, I'd like to read the biography of Julian Wallach. Born in Germany to Colombian parents, Julian Wallach has documented in both photography and writing, the diversity of his adopted hometown of New York. In doing so, Julian has helped others to find their voice and tell their stories. His work has been published in the New York Times, Rolling Stone Magazine, the Washington Post, and many other national and international publications. Julian's fascination for forgotten heroes and hidden cultural figures has been a leitmotif in his nonfiction graphic novels Ghetto Brother was named by Pulitzer Prize winner Juno Diaz in the New York Times, one of the best books of 2016. Joe Schuster won several international awards and was translated into seven languages. Basquiat was listed by the influential Comics Beat as one of the most important 100 graphic novels of the last decade. His latest book, Clayton, an anthology in the tradition of Harvey Picar's American Splendor, is an intimate portrait of artist Clayton Patterson, who has, as his friend Ai Weiwei puts it, relentlessly devoted himself to a kind of culture that examines authority, and who Anthony Bourdain described as archivist of all things Lower East Side. Julian Bullock, it's your time. Thank you. Let's see if the screen share works. Yep. All right. Okay. So here we go. Sake. Let me just. All right. So um, it's a it's a hard act to follow uh, after Ziona, who uh, I work with also in my, my role at Bechola Shon. Um, so what we'll do is um, focus a little bit on my photography first, then on on the graphic novels. Um, and I'm trying to be like short so that we can really have like a conversation more Q and A afterwards. So I moved to New York about 18 years ago um, and I see myself like as a, as a storyteller. So my, my art is storytelling and it's, it's an interesting um, combination now with Ziona because my process is very, very different. Um, so it is um, really going into communities, understanding them and trying to tell stories with images um, and words. So the first image you see here um, is, uh, was the cover of a book um, um, on, on Jewish New York. Um, and it describes, you know, very much, I mean, you, you see New York in the background, obviously the Empire State Building, the Star of David, um, and was taken on a rooftop of an abandoned synagogue in Brooklyn. Um, so my first series, uh, photography series, so I, I did, you know, various things, but my first complete series was called uh, Forgotten Heritage. Um, and it stems a bit from um, my upbringing in Germany. So in Germany, obviously, or in Europe in general, there is this uh, nostalgia tourism when it comes to former Jewish neighborhoods and areas, which of course has the sub context of the, the Shoah. Um, and in America, you don't have this. And especially in a city like New York, where everything is like about reinvention, it's real estate and so on, you don't have this. Um, so I tried to recreate um, this nostalgia photography in a way, um, going through New York areas like the South Bronx, Harlem. Um, this picture here is taken in Chinatown um, where you actually find the oldest Jewish cemetery of North America um, on the co congregation share in Israel. And so it was in a way like a, a scavenger hunt uh, through New York that I did for five years, um, visiting and revisiting areas and trying to um, document Jewish heritage sites. Here we have a picture from the Bronx. Um, it's this building actually is now, I was now converted into condos again, but it was at that time when I photographed it, probably 2005 um, abandoned. It was a former Hebrew Institute of University Heights. 
here we are in Staten Island. Um, and here in the Lower East Side, and the Lower East Side is the only area where I say there is an exception to the rule because the Lower East Side, of course, has um, so much to do with American Jewish identity that it's the only area where there is this, um, or at least was for a while, this nostalgia era, um, tourism. This is actually a photograph uh, from a Hispanic, now Hispanic um, radio station um, and uh, Pentecostal. And so, yeah, here we see the cross just nailed uh, on top of a window with a Star of David. And it's, these are images that, of course, you could have seen like, you know, in Hungary and Poland and so on, but they're really here in the heart of the, the largest Jew Jewish diaspora in the world. Um, I also photographed um, synagogues. Um, this is Bet HaMidrash Hagadol. Um, and interesting with this synagogue, I mean, it doesn't exist anymore. It, actually, the building collapsed, I think, two years ago. Um, but the murals here in this synagogue were interesting because normally Jerusalem was uh, depicted on, on walls, but here the murals actually depicted um, Tel Aviv Yafo. Um, it, it, the murals were created in a time um, um, pre-existing of the state of Israel where um, the Zionist movement was um, represented in the art. Um, and unfortunately the building was meant to become landmarked um, and unfortunately um, was uh, set on fire. Um, there are different versions how this happened, um, but the building was abandoned for, for over a decade. So it's it's a shame, but my photographs, and I have like a whole series on this, are uh, you know a documentation of a building that doesn't exist anymore. Um, of course, you know, if, if you in New York, the largest diaspora, uh, it's not just about the, the nostalgia, it's also about the self-confident presentation of uh, Jewish culture. And I think no other city in the world, and this is not Photoshop, this is really uh, a real street sign in New York. Um, would you find this? This is on the Williamsburg Bridge. Um, for those who are not familiar with the Williamsburg Bridge in New York City, um, it goes from uh, an ultra orthodox neighborhood into the Lower East Side. And um, in the 1910s, 1920s, it was sarcastically called the Jews Highway because so many Jews went on Shabbat walking on the bridge to their old neighborhood. Um, and yeah, here on this bridge, you find really an oy vey sign, which really is only in New York. And it was actually from an ex exhibition that was called Only in New York, which was, I want to say 2010, 2009, in collaboration with the Jewish Arts Salon. So it's a while back, but the sign is still there for those uh, who ever cross the Williamsburg Bridge. Um, so never, so a lot of times really my photography is like diving into um, cultures, becoming um, familiar with them, becoming an insider, um, and then documenting it once you have the trust developed um, to get like a inside view that you would not have. And, you know, using black and white photography, I mean, this is a little bit like uh, Robert Vishniak-esque, um, but of course this is like contemporary New York, this is in Borough Park. Um, here we have a gathering of uh, um, Shluchim from the Chabad movement. So once um, a year in, uh, this is actually was in November 13, uh, 2007. So, um, so it has actually a bar mitzvah now, uh, this photograph. Um, and so the interesting thing is normally if you see these um, photographs, they are taken from like a higher elevation um, but I wanted to really have it as a kind of like sea of uh, people. So I actually went down and uh, shot up. So it has like an interesting angle um, in the background, obviously the house of Menachem Schneerson, the Chabad rabbi. And then here um, also like a, a scribe. Um, so that really, it, it, I spent a lot of time um, with the Hasidic communities, obviously I'm not Hasidic, um, but really trying to like understand them better, the diversity also within the community. I mean, they're very different in its groups, um, which is for outsiders often not as understandable and really try to have an intimate portrait of them. Um, another group I uh, spent uh, a year and a half with are um, self-proclaimed uh, Israelites. So these are black Israelites. These are not uh, Jews for those of you in Israel, um, you know, there's a community in Dimona, um, and I thought it was very fascinating. So these are not Jews of color. I just want to explain this um, since I'm also like working for an organization called Bahola Shon. So these are um, people who have like a whole philosophy um, believing 
that they are descendants of uh, uh, Jews and the original Jews. Um, and so it's a, it's a self-proclaimed uh, group. They're also very diverse in its belief system. Um, and it, it was just a very fascinating insight because, um, you know, they, they uh, speak Hebrew, they follow, I mean, if you, I have audio recordings and if you would not know who these people are, you would assume it's just like, a, you know, any congregation anywhere in the world, but it's not. So um, worked with a journalist on this. Unfortunately, we never, we were planning to do um, like a larger book pro publication, but unfortunately never happened. But it was a very fascinating um, experience um, spending time with them and becoming, you know, acquainted and friendly with some of the members. Um, then I did a series um, that was shown, I think 2012, um, which was uh, a series of portraits of uh, New York Jews. Um, and, uh, you know, the, he is former mayor at Koch in the Lower East Side. Uh, so it was a mixture of like some prominent and other less prominent people. Um, we have here a portrait of um, a Soviet uh, war veter veteran photographed in uh, Brighton Beach. Uh, we see Coney Island in the background, so it's an area that where a lot of Russian speakers are. And so I ended up becoming friendly with this person here, Benjamin Melendez, who is a Marano Jew or was a Marano Jew. Um, and uh, he was also the founder of a gang in the South Bronx um, called the Ghetto Brothers. Um, Puerto Rican, uh, fascinating life story. And we um, we became friendly. I mean, I'm, I'm a Spanish speaker as well. Um, and I uh, had been in the Bronx extensively documenting um, former Jewish sites. And so with him, you know, we we had other layers of, of Bronx history and Jewish Bronx history that fascinated me. And initially I, I did a fumetti. Um, the Italian word fumetti um, means speech bubble. Um, but it's also used in English uh, for a uh, photo comic. And it was just like, um, like a journalistic storytelling um, experiment using his story and photography and words um, as a kind of like a first person narrative on, on his life. Out of this, however, um, became like a real graphic novel. So I worked with an illustrator friend of mine. Um, here are some pictures uh, from the book where I really told um, his story um, like, you know, in an illustrated novel, dealing on the one hand with gang culture and uh, early days of hip hop, but also with his Anosim upbringing and uh, reclaiming his Jewish identity. Um, the book, you know, as was mentioned, won a few awards, was praised, uh, translated in a few languages. And so it became like the starting point for me um, using graphic novels um, as a means of storytelling with the same offer uh, with the same illustrator, I um, adapted a 19th century uh, murder mystery novel, um, Crime and Punishment in a way. Um, it was one of the first pieces in German literature addressing anti-Semitism even before uh, the term existed um, called uh, The Jews Beech Tree. Um, then I uh, did um, a book uh, with Italian uh, artist Thomas Campi uh, on the early day, uh, basically on, on the creation of Superman, um, told from the perspective of um, Joe Schuster. Um, I was lucky enough to have early access to a whole box of letters written by um, Joe Schuster, who was the first illustrator of Superman. But it is also like, you know, it's, it's American comic book history, but it's also Jewish history because most of the pioneers were Jews. Um, then with... Uh, artist Henry Greer. I did a book um, called Remember the Spring, um, so far only available in French. Um, and it's about David Crook, um, who most people don't know, but he inspired um, um, Big Brothers Watching You. Um, he uh, spied on George Orwell. He was a communist, but he was also a British Jew who during the Cultural Revolution in China was arrested because of an intrigue and ended up for five years in solitary confinement. Um, the book is based on his autobiographical writings and I was fortunate enough to be in, uh, in contact with his uh, children. And um, then uh, I did a book uh, on uh, a soccer book actually, uh, on Bayern Munich's first championship 1932. Bayern Munich is uh, actually the current German champion in, in soccer. Um, and what most people are not aware is that soccer initially was um, 
frowned upon by the Nazis because it was a British sport. Um, and um, half the team of Bayern Munich was Jewish. After the championship, uh, half a year later, um, people had to flee. So it is it is this book about sports. Actually, just um, recorded this morning uh, um, a video because the book, uh, the, the Frank. I was meant to get a prize at the Frankfurt Book Fair for this book, um, but obviously none of these affairs are happening. Um, but so the book is, it's, it's about soccer, but it's also about um, history. Um, Basquiat, which was mentioned, um, came out last year as well um, with Søren Mostal, another um, Danish artist. And so I just want to talk about like this book because in every book I try to, um, play with storytelling. Um, there is an, actually, if you have the cover of this book, there is an app at RT Vive um, where if you look at the cover with this app open, you can actually see a video of Clayton Patterson. So Clayton Patterson is a videographer and photographer and I wanted to um, honor his, his uh, identity, legacy and um, as an artist. And so we built in this video um, that was recorded pre-pandemic that you can see with the app. And again, I, I, I'm using the Fumetti style for the opening. So um, the, the framing device is the story of a journalist um, played by a friend of mine, Sean Cathedral, who um, interviews Clayton Patterson on the Lower East Side. So, um, and using a Fumetti style again is honoring his legacy as a photographer. He's a well-known photographer on the Low East Side, but also his experiences on the Low East Side are very diverse. So we used a bit like the, in American Splendor, the idea of having different artists uh, illustrating different scenes or aspects of his life. Um, so illustrating the diversity of his experiences also in the illustrations. Um, you have three examples. Uh, this artist, Chris Wilson, actually imitates the uh, um, Robert Crumb style that you find uh, also in the American Splendor books. And Summer McClinton, who worked with Harvey Pekar, um, used like a food, like very um, realistic style based on photography and uh, also incorporating some of the photographs. With this, I'm actually stopping the share. So um, since the idea is to talk about like the pandemic, so this book obviously um, was done pre-pandemic, but you know, once the pandemic hit, um, it was really, really a challenge to um, to even like promote the book. I mean, everything, I mean, the whole idea of how you would, you know, work in this uh, was a big challenge. So we, we moved a lot to, um, you know, Zoom presentations and so on. Um, but I have to say the pandemic, like for so many people became a big challenge because it's just not the same. I and mean, in book presentation, I mean, we had things lined up with New York Public Library and so on, just didn't work. Um, so it's still uh, a big challenge, I feel like for any artist right now, um, trying to find the medium. And um, while my, my work um, is, my, I think my, the whole thing is that my work is really going into communities and mm -hmm working with communities, understanding communities. And this is obviously not the same if you interview people on Zoom. I mean, I, uh, it's, a, you know, it's collaborative um, work when I work with other um, illustrators and so on, but it's still, it's still a challenge. Um, and I don't know, it, it will be interesting because I have a few um, books that are basically put by my publishers on hold. So we'll, we'll see how long uh, the delays of projects are. But I'll leave it here. Um, this was just like an appetizer of uh, what I do and hopefully there are questions. Well, it was a fascinating presentation and I personally find it so interesting how you're coming from a European and also Latin American culture um, and approaching what is really a, the ultimate American art form. And I love how you bring your perspective to that and um, the, the, just the range and the array of how you're bringing in all these different graphic styles. So thank you, it's fantastic presentation, Julian. Um, I don't have any um, questions in the chat. I think people, you went at sort of a breakneck speed and I think people were just so absorbed in uh, looking at your work. But um, I think I could invite people either to, to write something quickly or just to kind of jump in if you have a question, just to, Go ahead, I can't see all the faces. Um, does anybody have a question for Julian? Yeah, first of all, I would like to say it was uh, fascinating. I love your work. 
It was great, uh, great presentation. And I wonder about those photographs about the synagogue uh, that was uh, burned. If the city uh, of New York City does have it in their archives, because I know they have historic uh, buildings that are destroying. I know uh, there are photographers that are doing this for the city. So I wonder. If I'm, I'm, I'm sure there are historic photographs of Beth Hamid Raj Hagadol um, existing. Um, I mean, my I, it just was a coincidence that I was able to get access um, to an organization that. Uh, deals with the preservation of um, Jewish heritage in the Low East that just before um, it burned down. I mean, I they gave me access. Um, I was there, it was like two months before or something like this. Um, I mean, there are historic photographs of it. And also when I did my research, um, a lot of like the addresses and so on I got because of the research of previous people um, doing it. I was in a way fortunate that I came to New York in a time when, um, well, gentrification was happening, but not uh, not as drastically. So that a lot of places, like in the South Bronx, I uh, you know I, I cycled around. So I took my normally the way it worked is I, I took my bicycle on the subway, got off, had a, a map, uh, and that was before you know you would have it today on your phone. But at that time, I had it on a map marked up, and cycled street by street with um, addresses. And I would say, often you know half of the addresses were not existing anymore uh, so that the synagogues were gone, but half of them were there. And um, But then with increasing gentrification and uh, real estate boom, a lot of places were just torn down. And it's the, I think the contrast here to in Europe would be, you know, any, or I guess anywhere outside of New York, any of these buildings would be preserved or landmarked for historic value. But in New York City, um, that is not the case. And with this building that burned down, there was an interesting dispute because some of the members in the congregation wanted to preserve the building because of its historic value. And half of the congregation who was retired in Florida wanted to sell the building because <laughs> there was a uh, real estate value. And um, you know, now actually in this spot, they're building like luxury condos. Obviously with the pandemic, uh, we'll see how the demand will be for um, luxury real estate in New York. But um, it, it really reflected like the historic um, challenges um, and because I was there in this time where you know a lot of things were still there um, Harlem for instance I mean I photographed a lot in Harlem and I would say 70% of the buildings I photographed were gone because Harlem became like a hot real estate uh, area I actually went um, so I gave also um, for a while like walking tours of neighborhoods and I remember that this Harlem tour I went with actually two Israeli investors and who were like taking notes and so on and they purchased like um an area um, and there were like two synagogues that were basically torn down by them to create luxury living opportunities there, so. Well, thank you, Julian. Um, we are just about out of time, but before uh, Dorit wraps things up for us, I'm just wondering, Julian, if you want to say a few words about Bechol Lashon, an organization that both you and Siona are involved in. For people yeah, absolutely. And I think there's one question about the Romanian synagogue uh, that also oh. collapsed. Um, and yes, okay. I have photographs of it. Um, and yes, also the Fordham Road East, uh, which is a Mercado synagogue. Uh, Carol asked, I have also photographs of this one. Um, so yeah, the Bronx I photographed a lot. So um, interesting enough, both Yona and I were part of the Speakers Bureau of Baolashan. Baolashan is an organization dealing with Jewish diversity. Jacob Schiff Center, exactly. Yes, I have uh, photographs of Jacob Schiff Center. Um, and uh, I, I happened to come to Bukola Sean actually through the graphic novel Ghetto Brother. Um, so I went, uh, did some talks for Bukola Sean and got involved with Bukola Sean. And the idea is really focusing on the diversity um, of Jewish experience. And, you know, I was fortunate enough to, so for Bukola Sean, I'm doing um, programming, um, work a lot on campus, and I was fortunate enough to have Ziona earlier. Uh, in the late summer, um, coming to some virtual events that we were able to do um, at uh, Fordham University, um, and hopefully we'll do more things. Um, and the idea is really to use culture um, to celebrate the diversity. And, you know, Ziona is a wonderful example of someone who uses um, her background creatively um, and creates, you know, expressions of Jewish diversity in her art. So Bechol Lashon is really an organization celebrating and exploring the diversity of the Jewish experience. I think it started 
with um, Anusim, uh, people who are hidden Jews in? No, it started actually with uh, right? the founder adopting um, a black child and being surprised about uh, um, the misconceptions uh, that she experienced as a mother. Um, so, um, but yeah, it, it, Anusim is like one of the groups we, we work with um, and really it's celebrating, you know, today, especially in America, about 20% of American Jews have diverse backgrounds. So um, reflecting this diversity in representation. Well, yeah, thank you been, so uh, I just wanted to say, I've been a part of Makola Shon before. They have training sessions and I've done programming with uh, Julian. And I think it's about just um, letting people know about the diversity in our Jewish you know, communities in life. It's just kind of bringing, uh, most people that talk to me, they say, I didn't know there were Jews in Colombia or India or Iran, you know? So it's just sort of letting, letting them know about the existence of these people there for thousands of years, not just overnight. Well, thank you both so much uh, for bringing uh, so many different perspectives to our group and your wonderful and inspiring art, exciting art. Thank you. Um, so Dorit, I think, has a few words for us. Okay, first of all, thank you so much, both of you. This was really a great session tonight. And thank you, everybody, for joining us tonight. And special thanks to our uh, uh, Open Studios volunteers, uh, Hannah Elias and Chesley Amerto, you are here. I didn't see Hannah. And of course, our program advisor, Yona Or without you, there is nothing going on here. And thank you, Judith, for putting it together with me uh, and good night.